Section 5 of The Day Boy and the Night Girl. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. The Day Boy and the Night Girl. The Romance of Photogen and Nycteris. By George MacDonald. Chapters 14 to 15. Chapter 14. The Sun. There Nycteris sat, and there the youth lay all night long, in the heart of the great cone shadow of the earth, like two pharaohs in one pyramid. Photogen slept and slept, and Nycteris sat motionless, lest she should wake him, and so betray him to his fear. The moon rode high in the blue eternity. It was a very triumph of glorious night. The river ran babble murmuring in deep soft syllables. The fountain kept rushing moonward, and blossoming momently to a great silvery flower, whose petals were forever falling like snow, but with a continuous musical clash into the bed of its exhaustion beneath. The wind woke, took a run among the trees, went to sleep, and woke again. The daisies slept on their feet at hers, but she did not know they slept. The roses might well seem awake, for their scent filled the air, but in truth they slept also, and the odor was that of their dreams. The oranges hung like gold lamps in the trees, and their silvery flowers were the souls of their yet unembodied children. The scent of the acacia blooms filled the air like the very odor of the moon herself. At last, unused to the living air, and weary with sitting so still and so long, Nycteris grew drowsy. The air began to grow cool. It was getting near the time when she too was accustomed to sleep. She closed her eyes just a moment, and nodded, opened them suddenly wide, for she had promised to watch. In that moment a change had come. The moon had got round and was fronting her from the west, and she saw that her face was altered, that she had grown pale, as if she too were wan with fear, and from her lofty place espied a coming terror. The light seemed to be dissolving out of her. She was dying. She was going out and yet everything around looked strangely clear, clearer than ever she had seen anything before. How could the lamp be shedding more light when she herself had less? Ah, that was just it. See how faint she looked. It was because the light was forsaking her and spreading itself over the room that she grew so thin and pale. She was giving up everything. She was melting away from the roof like a bit of sugar in water. Nycteris was fast growing afraid, and sought refuge with the face upon her lap. How beautiful the creature was! What to call it she could not think, for it had been angry when she called it what Watho called her. And wonder upon wonders, now, even in the cold change that was passing upon the great room, the color as of a red rose was rising in the wan cheek. What beautiful yellow hair it was that spread over her lap! What great, huge breaths the creature took! And what were those curious things it carried? She had seen them on her walls, she was sure. Thus she talked to herself, while the lamp grew paler and paler, and everything kept growing yet clearer. What could it mean? The lamp was dying, going out into the other place of which the creature in her lap had spoken, to be a sun. But why were the things growing clearer before it was yet a sun? That was the point. Was it her growing into a sun that did it? Yes, yes, it was coming death. She knew it, for it was coming upon her also. She felt it coming. What was she about to grow into? Something beautiful, like the creature in her lap? It might be. Anyhow, it must be death, for all her strength was going out of her, while all around her was growing so light she could not bear it. She must be blind soon. Would she be blind or dead first? for the sun was rushing up behind her. Photogen woke, lifted his head from her lap, and sprang to his feet. His face was one radiant smile. His heart was full of daring, that of the hunter who will creep into the tiger's den. Nycteris gave a cry, covered her face with her hands, and pressed her eyelids close. Then blindly she stretched out her arms to Photogen, crying, "'Oh, I am so frightened! What is this? It must be death!' I don't wish to die yet. I love this room and the old lamp. I do not want the other place. This is terrible. I want to hide. 
I want to get into the sweet, soft, dark hands of all the other creatures. Ah, me! Ah, me! What is the matter with you, girl? said Photogen, with the arrogance of all male creatures until they have been taught by the other kind. He stood looking down upon her over his bow, of which he was examining the string. There is no fear of anything now, child. It is day. The sun is all but up. Look, he will be above the brow of yon hill in one moment more. Good-bye. Thank you for my night's lodging. I'm off. Don't be a goose. If ever I can do anything for you, and all that, you know. Don't leave me. Oh, don't leave me, cried Nycteris. I am dying. I am dying. I can't move. The light sucks all the strength out of me. And, oh, I am so frightened. But already Photogen had splashed through the river, holding high his bow that it might not get wet. He rushed across the level and strained up the opposing hill. Hearing no answer, Nycteris removed her hands. Photogen had reached the top, and the same moment the sun rays alighted upon him. The glory of the king of day crowded blazing upon the golden-haired youth. Radiant as Apollo, he stood in mighty strength, a flashing shape in the midst of flame. He fitted a glowing arrow to a gleaming bow. The arrow parted with a keen musical twang of the bowstring, and Photogen, darting after it, vanished with a shout. Up shot Apollo himself, and from his quiver scattered astonishment and exultation. But the brain of poor Nycteris was pierced through and through. She fell down in utter darkness. All around her was a flaming furnace. In despair and feebleness and agony she crept back, feeling her way with doubt and difficulty and enforced persistence to her cell. When at last the friendly darkness of her chamber folded her about with its cooling and consoling arms, she threw herself on her bed and fell fast asleep. And there she slept on, one alive in a tomb, while Photogen, above in the sun glory, pursued the buffaloes on the lofty plain, thinking not once of her where she lay dark and forsaken, whose presence had been his refuge, her eyes and her hands his guardians through the night. He was in his glory and his pride, and the darkness and its disgrace had vanished for a time. CHAPTER Fifteen: THE COWARD HERO But no sooner had the sun reached the noonstead than Photogen began to remember the past night in the shadow of that which was at hand, and to remember it with shame. He had proved himself, and not to himself only, but to a girl as well, a coward, one bold in the daylight while there was nothing to fear, but trembling like any slave when the night arrived. There was, there must be, something unfair in it. A spell had been cast upon him. He had eaten, he had drunk something that did not agree with courage. In any case, he had been taken unprepared. How was he to know what the going down of the sun would be like? It was no wonder he should have been surprised into terror, seeing it was what it was, in its very nature so terrible. Also, one could not see where danger might be coming from. You might be torn in pieces, carried off or swallowed up, without even seeing where to strike a blow. Every possible excuse he caught at, eager as a self-lover to lighten his self-contempt. That day he astonished the huntsmen, terrified them with his reckless daring, all to prove to himself he was no coward. But nothing eased his shame. One thing only had hope in it, the resolve to encounter the dark in solemn earnest, now that he knew something of what it was. It was nobler to meet a recognized danger than to rush contemptuously into what seemed nothing, nobler still to encounter a nameless horror. He could conquer fear and wipe out disgrace together. For a marksman and swordsman like him, he said, one with his strength and courage, there was but danger. Defeat there was not. He knew the darkness now, and when it came he would meet it as fearless and cool as now he felt himself. And again he said, We shall see. He stood under the boughs of a great beech as the sun was going down, far away over the jagged hills. Before it was half down, he was trembling like one of the leaves behind him in the first sigh of the night wind. The moment the last of the glowing disk vanished, he bounded away in terror to gain the valley, and his fear grew as he ran. Down the side of the hill, an abject creature, he went bounding and rolling and running, fell rather than plunged into the river, 
and came to himself, as before, lying on the grassy bank in the garden. But when he opened his eyes, there were no girl eyes looking down into his. There were only the stars in the waste of the sunless night, the awful all-enemy he had again dared, but could not encounter. Perhaps the girl was not yet come out of the water. He would try to sleep, for he dared not move, and perhaps when he woke he would find his head on her lap, and the beautiful dark face with its deep blue eyes bending over him. But when he woke he found his head on the grass, and although he sprang up with all his courage, such as it was, restored, he did not set out for the chase with such an elan as the day before, and, despite the sun glory in his heart and veins, his hunting was this day less eager. He ate little, and from the first was thoughtful, even to sadness. A second time he was defeated and disgraced. Was his courage nothing more than the play of the sunlight on his brain? Was he a mere ball tossed between the light and the dark? Then what a poor contemptible creature he was! But a third chance lay before him. If he failed the third time— he dared not foreshadow what he must then think of himself. It was bad enough now, but then. Alas, it went no better. The moment the sun was down, he fled as if from a legion of devils. Seven times in all he tried to face the coming night in the strength of the past day, and seven times he failed, failed with such increase of failure, with such a growing sense of ignominy, overwhelming at length all the sunny hours and joining night to night, that, what with misery, self-accusation, and loss of confidence, his daylight courage too began to fade, and at length, from exhaustion, from getting wet, and then lying out of doors all night, and night after night, worst of all, from the consuming of the deathly fear, and the shame of shame, his sleep forsook him, and on the seventh morning, instead of going to the hunt, he crawled into the castle and went to bed. The grand health over which the witch had taken such pains had yielded, and in an hour or two he was moaning and crying out in delirium. End of section 5